an important part of a trauma assessment and treatment, and also part of the C in the March algorithm, is to apply a pelvic binder when it's indicated to do so. So we're gonna run through how to apply a pelvic binder, when you should apply a pelvic binder, and what to do if you don't have a commercial pelvic binder available. If you're getting value out of any of these videos we're producing, we'd love to hear from you. Leave us a comment below and let us know uh, what you find valuable and what you want to see in future videos. Leave us a like on this video if you uh, have enjoyed it, learned something from it. And as always, subscribe and turn your notifications on so you are alerted of any future videos we post. First off, let's take a look at the anatomy of the pelvis. So the pelvis is an open area um, that has a lot of space for potential bleeding. So if we have someone that has significant injury um, or a suspected pelvic fracture, we wanna stabilize these to minimize the pain and the potential blood loss by these bones um, severing arteries in the pelvis and allowing the pelvis to bleed out. So before we talk about applying the pelvic binder, let's talk a little bit about the anatomy. So the anatomy of a pelvis is we have this bony structure that actually has a, a large amount of area inside where someone could bleed out into. If we have a fracture of these bones, these sharp edges can cause pain on nerves and they can also sever arteries which then causes someone to bleed out in their pelvis. The pelvis can hold up to three liters of blood. This is a lot of blood loss that we can't do a whole lot of um, treatment for in the pre-hospital setting. Unfortunately, there's not a lot we can do for internal bleeding in the pre-hospital setting. But applying a pelvic binder is one way to stabilize that pelvis to try to minimize the chances of having severe bleeding in the pelvis. So applying one of these early in your treatment of a traumatic patient it could be very beneficial. So we have a fracture of the pelvis. The weakest part of the pelvis is the pubic bone, which is in front and down on the bottom side of the pelvic girdle. This is oftentimes one of the areas that's injured, um, but the fractures can happen in several different places in the pelvis. But regardless of where the fracture is, it's good for us to stabilize these to minimize the amount of pain and bleeding that is gonna be in the pelvis. Where do we not wanna put the pelvic binder? Well, we don't wanna stick this on the large wings, which is called the iliac crest. We don't want to put these on the upper part of the pelvis. These are going to be your hip bones. Um, they're going to protrude out. If you put it on here, we're actually going to be squeezing the top of the pelvis together, which is then going to act as a lever and pull the bottom apart, which makes those fractures even worse. So we actually want to be placing this pelvic binder on the greater trochanter. The greater trochanter is actually part of the femur. So the femur comes in and connects to the bottom of the pelvic girdle. And then we are going to be stabilizing around the greater trochanter, which is actually part of the femur, but that's going to in turn push the bottom of this pelvis back together and try to hold everything in place. So what we're doing with the pelvic binder is really just using um, something to help hold the pelvis together and stabilize that in place as we move this patient. So I have a SAM pelvic binder here. Really what it is is just a real wide sling that we can put around the pelvis. We're gonna put that in place and really all it does is a wide band that's holding that pelvis together. It's nothing fancy and we can use sheets and blankets if we don't have one of these commercial devices available. So when do we apply a pelvic binder to a patient? Well, the old school methodology for determining a pelvic fracture was to rock the pelvis. So you push in, push down, and you wanna see if you feel bones grinding against each other. So obviously, if you come across the point where you do that and you feel the bones grinding, you should stabilize that with a pelvic binder. I don't recommend going and grabbing the pelvis and rocking it back and forth to see if, oh yeah, we have a fracture, because you may have just made matters worse and increased pain and everything else for your patient. So the best thing to do is um, determine how bad this patient is and what the mechanism of injury was for this patient. Is there some reason we should suspect that they could have a pelvis fracture? So when should we place a pelvic binder? Well, the committee of TCCC has an outline under the C in their March algorithm. So as you are now treating and assessing for the circulation portion, the pelvic binder would fall under that category. And the outline that they have come up with is severe blunt force or blast injury with one or more of the following indications. So if we have severe blast trauma, um, we see it have severe blunt force, a uh, vehicle striking a patient, someone getting ejected from a vehicle, um, an IED, some sort of explosion, a fall of greater than 10 feet, some sort of large amount of trauma along with one of these other criteria. The criteria are pelvic pain, 
any major lower limb amputation or near amputation, physical exam findings suggestive of a pelvic fracture, unconsciousness, or shock. So if they've had a large amount of trauma to their body, specifically the lower portion of their body, and they have pelvic pain, or they're just critical, they have an amputation, they are unresponsive, they're in severe shock, anything like that, go ahead and throw a pelvic binder on them and stabilize for a potential pelvic fracture. If you put a pelvic binder on them and they don't need one, the worst thing that has happened is you've used up a piece of your equipment. If they have a pelvic fracture, you've now stabilized that and potentially limited increased pain and increased bleeding in the pelvic region. As we apply a pelvic binder, we want to try to do this before we move a patient. So if you've had someone in a car wreck that's still in the front driver's seat and you suspect they have a pelvic injury or a fracture, let's go ahead and place that pelvic binder on them while they're in the car to stabilize it so that it's stabilized when we go to move them out. Don't try to yank them out quickly unless their life is in danger. If the car's on fire, you have to do what you have to do. But if you have time to stabilize that pelvis, do so before you move them so that you don't make injury any worse when you go to move them out of the vehicle. What are we gonna use to stabilize this pelvis? Well, if you have it available, use a commercial pelvic sling or a pelvic device like this Sam pelvic sling. If you don't have one, you can improvise, but your first choice should always be something that is actually made for that job, kind of like a tourniquet. You can improvise a tourniquet, but the best option is always a device that is made for that specific job you need it for. Okay, so first off, we've talked a little bit about the anatomy and the placement, but I was gonna show you, it's a little hard to do it on the uh, dummy that we're gonna put it on in a minute, but I was gonna show you um, just some of the landmarks we're looking for. So remember the greater trochanter is gonna be the top of the femur. So that's gonna be pretty low here. The hip bone is gonna be up much higher here. We don't wanna put pressure there. Uh, we wanna put pressure on the outside um, of the femur or the greater trochanter. So there's a bony prominence. Um, you know, below belt level, and that's really where we're gonna be centering this sling as we put the sling on. So we'll take the sling, we'll put it on the patient, we will center it up here, tighten it down, and we wanna make sure that it's centered right at the point of that greater trochanter. So the sand pelvic binder is pretty small and lightweight, and I'll open this up and kind of show you how it's laid out before we put this on one of the dummies. Um, so we'll pull this out. There are some instructions in here that basically give you a quick rundown of where to place it and also how to uh, tighten it on there. It also has a note that says it can be left in place while the patient is undergoing an MRI or an x-ray. So as we open up this sling here, we have the area of the sling that will go up underneath the patient. We'll fold this together and then we've got this pretty typical SAM buckle. They use this on their tourniquet, their junctional tourniquet, and of course their uh, pelvic binder here. So we have a Velcro strap on this side that we can pull out. This will get slid underneath the patient. We will feed this back through, and then we're gonna pull pressure. When we pull enough pressure to secure it in place, uh, there will be two little pins that pop out of here and go into these holes. So that's how we know we've gotten it tight enough. When we put these on, we have a little handhold here and also another one on this side that we will pull opposite and tighten it down, which you'll see in just a minute. Okay, so we have significant damage. We've determined we're gonna place a uh, pelvic binder again. Anatomy and landmarks are gonna be a little different on this uh, mannequin here, but we are shooting for the outside um, of the femur, the greater trochanter. So we're gonna be placing this splint right here on the outside. So we wanna find a natural void to work this into. So uh, that would be the small of the back or that would be the knees right here. So I'm gonna use the knees, um, get this up under the paper. And what we're gonna do is we're just gonna kinda slide this up into place and work it back and forth until we get it in position. So once we have this up in place, we wanna make sure that it's pretty even from one side to the next. I'm gonna work this Velcro strap through here. I'm gonna pull on the strap and I'm gonna stabilize the other side with this hand holder. Pull it until these tabs come out. You'll hear a little bit of a click. I'm gonna secure this Velcro into place. I just heard a second click. That's the uh, little tabs popping back into place. So the tabs are actually not staying in place to hold this. They just keep me from over tightening it. So the Velcro is actually what's holding it in place. So you wanna make sure as you start to move this patient that this doesn't come undone because it will take that pressure off um, and then it's not gonna be effective. So the last thing we wanna do with this patient now is put them on a long spine board. That long spine board is gonna keep them in line and keep their legs from moving. If we stay pelvis, but the legs can still move as we start moving them, it's gonna put a lot of pressure on that pelvis that we don't want, and it's gonna be working against us here. So make sure we, you stabilize them to a long spine board and fully immobilize them so that pelvis is not moving. 
So the typical way to get someone on a spine board is to log roll them. That means we're gonna grab from one we're gonna roll them up, slide a spine board behind them, and lay them back on that spine board. The only problem with this is with the pelvic fracture, we're gonna be manipulating that pelvis a good bit when we roll. So it may be best to uh, pull them the length of the body straight up on the spine board. So we can position the spine board ahead of them, and we'll gently take them, lift them, or drag them, and we'll just gently put them on the spine board to keep everything in line so we're not moving anything sideways. So remember that the point of a pelvic sling is to stabilize the pelvis. The SAM sling is a perfect economical way to stabilize that. If you don't have one available, there are some other options. One of those is to use a blanket. We're gonna take and make a wide sling out of that blanket, and we're gonna fold it up around the pelvic girdle and stabilize it in place. A disadvantage of this is that you can't get this method as tight as you can the commercial devices. So it's not gonna work quite as well, but it's still an option to stabilize it if needed. So I'm actually using an emergency blanket here. Um, these can work, they don't, you can't put quite as much force on them and they're very easy to tear. So I don't recommend this, it's an option if you if that's all you have, but a regular bed sheet or some other type of blanket would actually work much better for this. I have taken my emergency blanket, I folded it down to about a foot in width. I'm going to slide this under a void. It's kind of hard to do on the dummy, but we don't want to manipulate this much. We would slide under the legs and then work it up. Once we have it in place, pull snug here, and then we're going to twist in place. Keep that pressure and twist several times. And zip tie on either side of here or duct tape or tie these off somehow so these are secured. And this will help keep some pressure on the greater trochanters to keep that pelvis together. So I have a RISE splint here. RISE stands for Rigid Immobilization System for Extremities. This is put out by Tactical Medical Solutions and this is a multi-purpose splint. So you can use this uh, not only for fractures, but also as a pelvic binder. And we'll go through that right now. Open this up. And basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna make a sling out of this and we're gonna use a tourniquet, uh, really any tourniquet to stabilize this in place. So I'm gonna go ahead and take this, slide it under a void here under the knees. So once I have this in place, I'm gonna take my tourniquet, I'm gonna loop it through a loop on one side, all the way down to the buckle through, pull it back on itself, make sure that stays in proper position. Now I'm going to tension this down and then I'm going to tighten it a little bit. This doesn't need to be near as tight as the typical tourniquet. I'm just going to put a couple turns on it to hold it. We're just trying to keep firm pressure right there, but this is one method to be able to stabilize a pelvis. So if you don't have any of those other options available, we can make an improvised uh, sling with a SAM splint and a tourniquet, the same way we did with the rise, but we actually have to cut a hole in it um, because the SAM splint doesn't have a hole. But we're gonna use the uh, SAM splint here, this foam splint. We'll fold it all the way out, um, and then I'm just gonna slice a hole for the cat tourniquet to go through. Now you do have to be careful when you tension these because you have now cut a hole in that aluminum. If you put too much pressure on it, it'll tear the aluminum, but we shouldn't be putting that much pressure on there anyway. So uh, this should work well to stabilize the uh, pelvis. So you can use trauma shears or a knife. I'm gonna make a hole here. I'm gonna do the same thing on the other side. You don't want it too close to the edge. You wanna make sure you come back a good ways. And don't get too close to the outside either because if this ends up tearing, it will give way a lot easier. So I'm gonna slide this under a void here. Work this up into place. If your holes are too close to where you can't get the tourniquet in there, you can recut a hole further back. We'll do the same thing as we did with the other one. We'll slide this up into place, all the way down to the buckle, all the way through on this one. Secure it in place, and then just a couple twists on here to help stabilize that pelvis. Some good pressure there. Make sure this gets secured so it doesn't come off because if we lose that Velcro there, um, it's not gonna be effective. I'll go ahead and tighten that down to make sure it doesn't come off. And there is our improvised pelvic sling with the SAM splint and a tourniquet. 
That's several different options for stabilizing a pelvic fracture or a suspected pelvic fracture. Remember, if you have significant trauma and you suspect they could have a pelvic fracture, let's go ahead and stabilize that pelvis before we start moving and manipulating them too much. Uh, the more that we can stabilize it now, the better outcome they will have if they do have a fracture. So let's go ahead and take care of that now. Remember that commercial devices are always the best way um, because they're intended for that specific purpose. But if you have to improvise, we've shown you some tips and tricks to be able to improvise if you have to. But always try to go with the commercial uh, product first. So that's it for the pelvic stabilization. Hope you learned something from this. Uh, remember to leave us a comment below if you have any questions. We look forward to hearing from you. And as always, stay vigilant and stay safe.